Hello, I'm Katrina Fox and I'm joined today by Kerry Teal and Christine Dorchak from Grey 2K USA Worldwide, which is the largest greyhound protection organisation in the US. Kerry and Christine, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having us. So we're going to talk about ethical sponsorship a little bit today. Um, and let's start with some of the benefits. What are some of the benefits for organisations to partner up with organisations such as yourself, which are ethical? And by ethical, we mean um, organisations that uh, don't involve harm to animals, people or planet. Well, what we found in the United States is that um, any... or any commercial enterprise that supports dogs is a winning enterprise. In America, people love dogs. So um, companies that support the protection of dogs often get benefits from, from doing so. Things are different in the United States, however, because dog racing is a state regulated um, enterprise rather than something, and it's a commercial enterprise itself. The idea of other commercial enterprises sponsoring it is a little bit different well, here in Australia, the, the greyhound racing industry has been sponsored by other commercial businesses, which has been uh, a point of controversy, of course, uh, as the dog racing industry is starting to, to unravel here and citizens are, are learning about how this industry works and the problems it has, uh, businesses have, have become reluctant to continue their relationships with with the industry but i think those are two sides of, of the same coin we're seeing a uh, fundamental change all over the world in uh, how we relate to other animals we're seeing the passage of animal protection laws uh, you know in, in countries uh, from one end of the globe to the other and certainly a stronger business ethic around uh, the humane treatment of animals and compassion for animals you know naturally goes hand in hand with that that fundamental change that we're seeing mm -hmm. so I, I i would say that it's an imperative what for, benefits do they get out of it well they, they get to continue existing to begin with i mean i think the dog racing industry is a good example of a commercial enterprise that is you know on the way out because it doesn't have uh, a strong ethic or any ethic really regarding uh, the humane treatment of animals. So, you know, th this is a change that we're undergoing as a society. And uh, so I, I, I think the businesses that have uh, humane ethics will, will be rewarded in the coming years. And the businesses that don't, or uh, on the extreme end, the businesses that actually exploit animals will, will end up at a competitive disadvantage in the marketplace. Mm. What kind of damage can that do to their brand? We talk about some of the, if we flip that, we talk about some of the benefits. What are some of the, the dangers or the damages of, of not going down that path and of s still supporting these kind of industries? Well, in the U.S., our biggest fight actually uh, was with a company that filmed um, its Super Bowl ad um, at the Tucson Greyhound Park in Arizona. And this was just a fundamental mistake. Dog racing is so unpopular. So the idea of using this this track in particular, which is one of the worst in the country, as a backdrop for their big Super Bowl ad was a huge mistake. Um, it was a company, or it is a company, that makes running shoes. So the idea was that somebody uh, who would be in their shoes could run faster than a greyhound. Um, cute, but not so cute, really, when yeah. we look at it more closely. So when we learned that Skechers, which is the company, was going to film this ad, we went right into uh, you know full campaign mode. And we had people from around the United States and around the world contacting the company, telling this would be a big mistake. But they'd already scheduled it, and they did move forward. Wow. Um, and they did, in fact, release the ad. Um, but unlike other Super Bowl ads, Super Bowl ads, I must say, are the biggest ads any company can place at any time in the United States and perhaps worldwide, I'm not sure, but it's it, they're very big. And they, in fact, ran the ad once, and we never saw it again on commercial television. So I guess they decided 
to push forward. And then the backlash was so strong that they said that was a mistake and we've never seen the ad again. Did they come, did they come out and say it was a mistake? No, they, they didn't. They uh, just kind of quietly. No, they're, they're, yeah. they just, we just never saw <laughs> it again on commercial television. That's great. That's a really good, really good example. It's interesting you say that dog racing is really unpopular in the US because we've not quite got there yet here in Australia. It's still like with, with greyhound racing. We've had that big expose, which is fantastic, but I guess we're probably still at the beginning um, of, of perhaps where, where you guys are. So can you tell me about maybe some of the successes that you've had in partnering with or approaching uh, businesses to support your organization? Well, the to start with the first part of your question, um, you know, dog racing is, is in decline uh, in the United States, in the UK, and I think we're going to see a similar arc here in Australia, really because this industry contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. I mean, the, the, the fundamental problem this industry has, and I think this is very relevant to business ethics, is it uh, comports itself in such a way uh, it uses you know various industry standard practices that are intended to reduce cost and, and really turn every single dog into a mini investment where you're trying to secure the highest return from that dog while incurring again the least amount of expense and in the context of a society that that views dogs as companions as members of the family uh, you know they dogs play an incredibly important role in our lives that is you know out of step with where mainstream values are so you know this is this is an industry that essentially the world around it has changed and it is refusing to to change with the rest of the world and that that level of when, when you have i know here in australia you use the term social license um this is not a term that's commonly used in the u.s but i think that's what you're talking about you know that this is an industry that does not have uh, a social license, essentially, because the way it does business is 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 disconnected from where society as at, at large is. In terms of uh, the relationship with the business community and our work in the U.S., uh, and this may surprise you, but ironically, the 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 biggest support we've had from the industry in the U.S. has been from the track owners themselves, and I'll explain what I mean by that. The American dog racing industry is is in its its uh, final uh, sort of death spiral. It's in the process of being completely eliminated. The only thing that's keeping it alive is there are private racetrack owners, which is unlike unlike the United States. And these private racetrack owners uh, also have other types of gambling, like poker rooms. And the law says they must race dogs in order to ha have these other types of gambling. And uh, in Florida, for example, where we do uh, you know, our top uh, state in terms of work that we do, there are 12 operational tracks. All 12 tracks are losing money on Greyhound racing. Collectively, they're losing more than $40 million a year, but they're continuing to race because they have to race in order to have these poker rooms. So we've gotten to such a point in the U.S. that the track owners have actually come to us and said, Let's work together to disconnect these and allow us to you know, slowly phase out this industry completely. So, you know, that it's it, not what you would expect, yeah. but that, that has been our closest ally in the business community has actually been these private racetrack owners themselves. That's good to hear. That's very unusual and very contrary to free market principles, which really are what reign in the United States. So the idea that a business is required to conduct one activity or offer one product to offer another, that, that is very, uh, that's unheard of. Um, and the track owners are glad to point that out. Um, and in this case, they want to save dollars because they're losing money on dog racing. And we want to save dogs. Mm -hmm. And the answer is the same and dog racing. So ironically, the dog track owners who for years fought activists and said there's nothing wrong with dog racing have changed their tune. And now they're joining with advocates, they're joining with us and saying, let's end dog racing. And whatever their reason is, that is irrelevant. If it will save dogs, sure. we're all for it. Well, and, and to put this in the context of, of a business model and what's happening there, we, we have gone from the industry peaked in the early 1990s, you know, about 1991. And 
you know, since that peak, we've gone from three and a half billion dollars wagered wagered on dog racing to about six hundred and twenty million dollars wagered on dog racing. So, you know, catastrophic decline. We've gone from the industry being legal and operational in nineteen states to the industry being uh, legal and operational in seven states mm -hmm. and being outright prohibited in thirty nine states. Uh, we've gone from you know about sixty five tracks uh, uh, at its peak to twenty one operational tracks. So the, the the decline has has been so significant, um, and and that certainly there's multi many factors for that. Mm -hmm. there, so there, just there, just coming back to the business yeah. side um, uh, of things. So in terms of so what I'm understanding is in the U S. you don't really have like corporate businesses or businesses sponsoring. Um, the greyhound industry, the dog industry, got it. Okay, so perhaps if we look at that, take that from because obviously in Australia and I believe I think in the UK as well, it's a different model where you know companies do come on and they they support this. We've talked about some of the benefits and some of the dangers. Yeah. Um, so if we perhaps perhaps get your take on this uh, from an um, uh, from an Australian perspective, what sure. your thoughts on this are? Um, businesses rarely lead the way in this kind of thing. They often follow public opinion, which it yeah. sounds like that's what's happen with your track mm -hmm. owners that you know the, the, the industry has declined um, what sort of um, what opportunities does that give to ethical business owners for actually taking a lead and taking a stand um, against being involved with or sponsoring an event particularly that involves animal cruelty I would reframe the question slightly which is my, my understanding and, and you know Christine and I have spent the last you know few days you know, meeting with advocates, meeting with the industry itself here in Australia, and trying to learn as much as we can about uh, the you know the Australian greyhound racing industry from a humane perspective, from an economic perspective. The business model is not as different as you would think. Um, it, it's true that there are uh, private business sponsorship of greyhound racing um, in Australia and also in the UK, but that is a very small percentage of the total revenue coming into the industry. The vast majority, the, the, the business model in, in Australia, as far as we can tell, is is very heavily dependent on the TAB revenue, essentially yeah. the sort of ubiquitous off-track betting that, that's everywhere. Um, in, in the UK, um, the, the business is heavily dependent on the bookmakers yeah. through William Hill and you know, sort of true. everywhere. So that that really is, the in terms of, of you know, the, the economic, how, how the economics that's are working, you know, that really is the fundamental issue and, and the piece that, you know, animal advocates here are going to have to, to find a solution to. But I think moving forward um, that all businesses are going to be at a competitive advantage if they have a sense of humane ethics and they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage if they don't. And even within the gambling industry, I think in the coming years you're going to see the gambling uh, interests that uh, don't exploit animals or have you know, some sense of humane ethics um, are going to be at a competitive advantage. And the industries like, like the commercial dog racing industry that, that view animals as commodities are going to be at a, commer at a commercial disadvantage. Now that, 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 you know, that, that's at, you know, at a big level that you know, may take years or decades to play out, but there's no doubt that's where this is going. Excellent. In the U.S., we're seeing um, quite a few car commercials that support saving dogs in particular. Um, cars with very good brake systems, and the ad will show someone going down a road and being able to break quickly so that the animal is not hurt. So, and these are feel-good commercials. We've seen companies that uh, will donate a percentage of their profits to shelters or uh, advocacy organizations such as ours. So there's really a lot of goodwill that comes from supporting humane efforts, and that's uh, certainly what the U.S. businesses are seeing. Fantastic. So when you're looking to collaborate or get some kind of support from the business world, what kind of criteria do you have in place to choose who you'll work with or who you won't work with? Well, where, where we have uh, relations with businesses would be in what are referred to in our country as co-venture agreements. So, for instance, um, one of the biggest uh, makers of video game um, components or video game um, 
Designs, um, Tryon World is about to do a promotion with us in which they will offer little Greyhound mounts that can be put on the electronic video games. Uh, for, and when they do that, um, when they buy the Greyhound mount, a donation will be made to us. So we have companies that are approaching us every month with ideas. Well, we'll sell uh, T-shirts and donate a percentage of proceeds to you. So our criteria uh, for doing that um, would be whether you know the company is itself ethical. We've not been approached by mega million dollar companies, so we haven't had big controversial decisions to make. It's been pretty clear that you know a company that makes video games is okay. There are not a lot of ethical issues there. So um, so far we haven't been challenged in making these decisions. The t-shirt makers, um, the florists, and so forth that have you know engaged with us in that manner, they've gotten a lot out of it because. We have a uh, hundred hundred thousand supporters. So when we go into a co venture agreement, they look really really well with a particularly animal loving constituency. That's great. So are you getting most of your support then from sort of smaller business or SME um, yes. type businesses? That's right. Yeah. We're really in the end game phase in terms of dog racing in the U.S. being completely prohibited. Now that to get to that point, we're still probably another decade or two away from completely finishing the job because when you when you're dealing with an industry that is this economically significant culturally significant you know it's it even in its final death spiral it is resilient uh, but because we are so heavily engaged in the legislative process, a lot of the business contacts we have are usually through their legislative representation, through through their lobbyists. Um, so we, we certainly have ongoing you know, conversations with the dog racing industry, competitors of the dog racing industry, um, in terms of the legislative process. Uh, but in terms of our support as an organization, you know, we're primarily supported by, as Christine said, you know, many individual supporters uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Now, we do have support from some very notable business leaders. Um, Eddie DeBartolo, who is the owner of the San Francisco 49ers, for example, is, is a supporter of our organization um, and is really, you know, one of the, the most, I think, respected, um, you know, businessmen. Uh, in the world, probably, but but again, he's supporting us, you know, not necessarily from a business perspective, but because he cares about this issue and wants to see something change for these these very gentle dogs. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think that's where it's going to come from. It's not necessarily; it may not even come from a business or a company perspective. It's individuals or uh, an individual within a company, particularly if they're quite high up, that can drive that and help to change the public opinion. And and just on that, I mean, I noticed you started in two thousand one, so. You know, 14 years later, and as you've mentioned, you're, you know, kind of coming towards the end of your campaigning. So you've obviously made some big changes. So what recommendations would you give um, to other advocacy organisations about how to educate not only the public, but also the business world in these kinds of issues, particularly here? Because, you know, with racing, certainly with horse racing and to some degree as you, uh, with, with greyhound racing, you see it's, it's been a national pastime you know it's seen as a fun and a family uh, friendly event and um, it can be quite difficult to um, you know break with those traditions to actually go well actually here's the reality so what are your tips for how to go about educating particularly the business world about these issues well I recently sent a letter to the Greyhound bus company um, a, a natural a supporter, I would think, um, and I, I got the most wonderful letter back from the CEO, and he said in his letter that he supports our mission entirely. Um, at this point, the company uh, apparently has a, a lot of uh, co-venture agreements and pr does a lot of promotions that are already in place, but he will consider working with us in future because Greyhound Bus Lines doesn't think a lot about greyhound racing, um, and I think wouldn't mind the opportunity to say so. Um, so we're hopeful that in, in future, uh, that the greyhound bus lines, for instance, will have a picture of a greyhound on the side that says, save the greyhounds, you know, getting out the message to the public that these are dogs that are at risk because of a cruel industry, and that cruel industry should be ended. Well, and I, I would say, you know, number one, be courageous. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to lose. 
I saw an excellent interview with Malcolm, the author Malcolm Gladwell mm -hmm. uh, a, a month or two ago where he, he, he was talking about how uh, he, his, his most recent book is in part about uh, how you know, business executives in New York uh, became successful because they had nothing to lose and they weren't afraid to take risks. And I, I think t when you are fighting for fundamental change and you're fighting against an industry that is so heavily entrenched, I mean, this uh, battle really is between our, our people and the money and muscle of this industry. So when, when you have that type of challenge, you have to keep, keep going. When you, when you suffer defeats, pick yourself up and keep going. I mean, we have seen... Uh, incredible, incredible victories for greyhounds, and you know, just since our formation, gambling on dog racing in the U.S. has declined by 68 percent, and the rate of decline in those years is, is more than double what it was in the year in the similar years previous to our formation. But we've seen, you know, defeat, 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 victory, defeat, 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 victory, mm -hmm. and and so you have to be willing to go through that process. Um, I also think that. The animal protection community must have a very solid policy foundation for everything that they do. It can't simply be, we think this is bad and it has to end. Uh, one of our goals is to understand the dog racing industry better than it knows itself. Mm -hmm. You know, understand the business model, understand the culture, understand um, everything we can about this industry. Mm -hmm. and, and then from that, we simply present the public with accurate facts about how greyhound racing works and ask them, would you treat your dog this way? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a process of doing the, the policy work, um, understanding the political process and the advocacy process, engaging, being creative, uh, being dogged, if you don't mind the bad pun, yeah. um, and you know, not being afraid to lose. For sure. And just the final question then, Carrie, I notice you're a, a national chess master, so I'm guessing you're pretty good at strategy. <laughs> what do you think is the best move, just in a nutshell, very briefly, what's the, the best move that businesses that want to be perceived in the marketplace as ethical can do right now? Well, I think you have to look forward. I mean, if, if you are not constantly looking forward to try and understand not only what what is the world like today but what is the world going to be like tomorrow then at some point you're going to be obsolete and that's the situation that the greyhound racing industry finds itself in it, it, it is a uh, 1950s era industry that happens to exist today and, and and that's in its business model in terms of its its ethic regarding how animals in this in industry are treated. It, it, it is an industry from generations ago that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that failure to change, mm -hmm. it is in the process of ending. And that should be a canary in the coal mine for everyone else in the business community that... Except you, we don't really want canaries in coal. <laughs> <laughs> Figuratively. <laughs> a figurative canary in the coal mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Thank you both so much. Mm -hmm.